Hi, I'm Joyce Sakubin. I'm the Communications and Development Manager for the Clinton Foundation. Welcome to the Clinton Presidential Center. I'm so glad to see you all here today um, for the last in our three-part series, A Little More Conversation, Elvis Presley. Before I begin, I want to thank our partners, the Clinton School of Public Service, Dean Skip Rutherford and Nikolai DePippa, my partner in crime, for their support in making this series a reality. Elvis Presley's talent good looks, sensuality, charisma, and good humor endeared him to millions, as did the humility and human kindness he demonstrated throughout his life. President Bill, Bill Clinton wrote about Elvis in his autobiography, My Life. He wrote, beyond his music, I identified with his small town, small town southern roots, and I thought he had a good heart, and that's probably the reason why today, which is the 34th anniversary of Elvis's death, why his legacy is still so strong. We paid tribute to Elvis this summer through two exhibits, Elvis and Elvis at 21 photographs by Alfred Wertheimer. The Elvis at 21 exhibit is in association with the Smithsonian and is comprised of 56 pictures taken by Alfred Wertheimer. The pictures highlight a fleeting moment in Elvis's life, a young musician about to enter the world of stardom in 1956. The Elvis exhibit is a, in partnership with Graceland in Memphis, Tennessee, complete with Elvis's red, personal red MG from the movie Blue Hawaii and paintings by Peter Mars. I'm pleased to have Peter here today. Peter Mars has been the leader of, um, of the avant-garde avant pop movement for the past 20 years. The artist's sensibilities fall somewhere, as Mars says himself, in the area where nonsense and popular culture so frequently meet. Using the joy and nostalgia found in everyday objects like wallpaper, candy wrappers, billboards, and matchbooks, Peter explores popular culture, the passage of time, and icons like Elvis Presley. Through rare collaboration with Elvis Presley Enterprises, Mars has been granted unfettered access to their extensive photo um, photograph archive, which includes over 60 thousand photographs. Mixing inks and paints, em employing a silk screen and hand painting, Mars creates the texture, complex layers, and energy with the signs of the king. Please help me welcome artist Peter Mars. Hi everybody. Um, so nice to be here in Little Rock again. It's a, just a beautiful little city and uh, I really enjoyed my last visit here. So it's nice to be back. Uh, Today, we're going to talk about this guy, Elvis Presley. And uh, I'm here to kind of explain why an artist like me would be so fascinated with, uh, with a personage like this, of, of Elvis. Uh, when I first you know, heard of Elvis, I was just a little kid, like about this big. <laughs> and what all the big kids were, were learning about was this. And uh, Elvis was, at that time, just a mega star and uh, had everybody talking, had all the adults upset, and uh, all the kids very excited. So, um, but I'm at, for, to start out with, I'm gonna kind of dig digress into uh, some talk about the art world and why uh, a celebrity like Elvis Presley is important to our culture and why he is worthy of making paintings and uh, talking about his legacy. Uh, I'm a pop artist, so that means uh, it's, a, it's an artist that uses uh, images from popular culture. So here's a picture of Times Square in New York uh, around the year that Elvis was born, and we can see the beginnings of American popular culture. Uh, this is Another shot, this would be something equivalent going on in Europe where uh, signage and uh, billboards are dominating the landscape. Uh, artists at the time began to uh, bring in elements of popular culture into their art. 
This is a Picasso drawing in the, in the Cubist uh, tradition. And you'll notice he's kind of blatantly pasted a part of the, the uh, newspaper right there in the center of the artwork. And this is real early on, like maybe 19, 1915 or something like that. And we see the first incursions of popular culture into the realm of fine art. Uh, here's another uh, Picasso. This one is 1913. Again, he's, he is working within the uh, constraints of the Cubist movement where everything is reduced to a geometric shape. But you can also at the same time see that popular culture is, is very much um, uh, evident. And he has everything from, you know, uh, advertising that is uh, coming out of newspapers to product boxes. This is like a box top from some kind of ladies lingerie. Uh, another one of my favorite things is, is wallpaper patterns. And he, uh, Picasso has brought the wallpaper pattern into that artwork. Um, next comes along a, a really fantastic artist named Stuart Davis, who is also in the Cubist school and using the geometrical shapes that the Cubists were known for. But you see there's definitely a prominence of, of product placement and like advertising placement is now uh, being brought in and, and shown in museums, in paintings that, that hang in museums. This is a, uh, one of the first signs that the art world is going to get stood on its head very shortly. Uh, it's 1919, Marcel Duchamp, and just with a very simple uh, amount of graffiti, he has completely transformed and kind of thumbed his nose at uh, the uh, conventional art world. And uh, this painting kind of portends the coming of the age of modern art. Now I'm skipping way forward. I, I will be doing a lot of jumping back and forth so uh, through the decades, but uh, I kind of like that anyway about the passage of time. And so here's Keith Haring, who is now, you can see where he's actually placed one of his artworks in line with the other billboards as if it's just another advertisement um, in the subway, in the New York subway. Uh, this is a Roy Lichtenstein painting, one of the early, uh, what, what came to be called the pop art movement. And of course, these type of paintings drew their, uh, their inspiration from from just a lot of the silly, uh, you know, popular culture that, that we have. This one coming out of a comic book. Uh, and here's an advertisement. Many times advertisements and artwork were playing back and forth to each other. Uh, this advertisement is explaining to us, I guess, because they think that we can't, we don't, at the time, modern art, this type of rendering was so uh, unusual that you really didn't know maybe what was being depicted. So they're showing you, it's, this is a pipe, it's a drawing of a pipe, uh, as if it needs to be explained to the audience. And then, in the back and forth between artists and advertising, you now have a Magritte painting, the famous Surrealist, and he's written below that 
this is not a pipe. <laughs> because the serverless like to play uh, games with uh, the meanings of objects and, uh, and in fact, it, this, it truly is not a pipe, it's a painting. So, and there's a big distinction. So I think he was um, kind of trying to point that out. There are also some paintings made during this era that we wouldn't necessarily think are being influenced by popular culture. And this is one by um, the famous artist Miro. It's uh, like a surrealist landscape. And you really can't, I don't know, when you're first looking at this painting, you, you're kind of wondering, what was he thinking? But then this was the maquette for the drawing of this painting. So in the maquette, you can see uh, that he's taking things out of catalogs and, and again, everyday life type of things, and then, um, and then rendering them into a surrealist point of view. So artists were increasingly looking to these types of publications, catalogs, Sears catalog, you know, we had all sorts of um, printing that was being done at that time. This is another example of a Moreau painting done around the same time where he is using parts out of a silverware catalog or possibly might have been a silverware uh, advertisement or something and his original uh, collage, the ideas for the painting are coming from a, a mundane source such as a silverware catalog. This painting marks another hallmark in the, uh, the transition into what would be called the, the pop art movement proper. And this is pointed to, this particular painting is pointed to as, uh, as the first work of pop art. And it's by Richard Hamilton, a British artist at the time. And it has pretty much all the hallmarks of what would become pop art within the next few generations. You have household appliances. You have um, this idealized American family where you know the husband is, is a big muscle man and the wife is wearing I don't know what on her head. And uh, the, the elements of the comic book are there, the automobile, the movies, uh, many of these themes that we will see uh, played out across the development of, of uh, contemporary pop art. Now I'm jumping back to another Stuart Davis. This one is from 1924, and we can see that, that these elements of company logos, corporate advertising, product design, uh, again, were being brought in all during this, this era. Here's an ad from, probably from a phone company, I'm guessing. And then we see the painting that Andy Warhol made from that ad, using that ad as inspiration. And so this begins the, uh, the beginning of the, the Warhol era. And the beginning of, in our society, of just seeing all of these mass-produced products and the, uh, the repetition of the products and the packaging and, and all of these things that would become themes of pop art in the coming years. As 
almost imitating the uh, grocery store shelf. I'm sure you've all seen these paintings before, but when you look at them right there with something that we see in our everyday life, you can see how those images are just taken um, from things we see around us all the time, yet it, he's having fun with it and it is, it is entering the world of fine art. Also at the same time that, uh, that mundane things that we repeatedly saw in, in our everyday lives were, were being painted about, now we had a new, uh, a new happening which was kind of called the movie star and uh, this is around the time when Elvis would have been big and making movies and Marilyn was equally a superstar and she was being painted by uh, different artists of the era. This is a painting of her by Andy Warhol again and showing, uh, this is the first slide I'm showing where uh, you can see the, that a silk screen is being used and I use a similar technique so I wanted you to, to, uh, to see the, uh, how much impact and uh, brash and bold the, uh, the technique of silk screen can bring out. Um, this is Robert Rauschenberg uh, print made probably right around the same time as that Marilyn. Uh, presidents are equally uh, famous personages that we would see in our everyday life and repeated to us many, many times on television. So we begin to see images kind of bombarding us. The images don't always make sense because one minute we might be looking at this uh, image and the next minute you change the TV channel and you're looking at something else or you're flipping the pages in a magazine and uh, you're getting kind of bombarded with various images. This is uh, also, this particular painting has a real nice hallmark of pop art that you can see where repetition, again, going back to the, uh, the Campbell soup cans, but the repetition of the president's hand and the, the use of it almost appearing like the artwork was made by a machine that was somehow skipping a beat or not quite working right and uh, this idea of whether it would be a record that uh, you had on your turntable that was caught in a groove or, or something on TV that just seemed to, images that just seemed to continually um, bombard us. The presidents were equally fascinating to pop artists. Uh, this is I, another inspiration for a work of pop art. The, at the same time that the pop artists are interested in famous and uh, you know repeated images that we see, it also is in the mundane images that we see, the silly, the stupid, the uh, just the stuff that you almost don't even notice in our world, but we're seeing that so many times that uh, it's almost like we begin to have a memory of, of them or we record them in our brain somewhere. So this is a Jeff Koons sculpture. It's a metal sculpture that he made and it's based on just a silly, uh, silly blow up doll of a bunny rabbit but now this has by this point firmly ensconced itself in the lexicon of uh, fine art. Okay here is one of the first uh, 
areas that, that began to influence me personally as an artist. I just wanted to show you this as these are called ghost signs and you can kind of see where like at some point, well these, paint, these signs were painted on there maybe back in the 30s or 40s or something like that. And then another building was built and the wall covered the old mural, the old billboards. Um, and then when the building was torn down, that mural, those billboards were preserved, but they are misplaced in time because we have modern cars here. Yeah, we're looking at advertisement from a different age. Another fascinating part that I really love about this type of thing and that I'll explain more about my own work is that you can see the one billboard is fading through to the next. So here we have a Coca-Cola billboard. It looks like there was an old Coca-Cola back here that was then painted over by the phone company and uh, this detergent manufacturer. So you begin, in, in a way, these ghost signs kind of document to us or tell us the story of this bombardment of images that we see every day and how one image hits us and then kind of fades away and then a new image of, of something new immediately hits us because we're seeing these so every few minutes we are being shown one of these advertisements. Uh, here's a beautiful old mint julep sign. I saw it in, uh, in New Orleans just uh, a few months ago where uh, the wall had been torn down and there's this beautiful old vintage sign in the background. Uh, the surrealists and the Dada people picked up on this type of stuff, you know, starting in the 40s and earlier, but this is one of my favorite artists, Kurt Schwitters. He, um, he was active in the Dada movement, and Dada just kind of made fun of uh, a lot of uh, popular culture and kind of turned it on its head the way that we saw the uh, Mona Lisa painting that had been uh, graffitied on. Here's another Kurt Schwitters now moving into what we would almost consider a modern uh, artwork of, of pop art, drawing things from uh, comic books, candy wrappers, uh, photos, pages out of a magazine, and this type of thing. Okay, this is me when I first got out of college and decided I wanted to be an artist, and I was living in the French Quarter of New Orleans. You can see a, a, a real nice ghost sign here. Um, the, uh, in, New Orleans, in the French Quarter, they don't allow uh, anyone to paint over any of the old buildings uh, because it's, it's, a, uh, it's a historic district. And so it, many of the beautiful old walls and like the patinas on these walls are all preserved. And so these billboards were real inspirational to me uh, that I would see around the city of New Orleans. Um, this, when I first started trying to be an artist, uh, I was working in an art gallery at this time in New Orleans and, and making art and starting to try to take myself seriously as an artist. And I was pretty much the kid that spent a lot of time on this back page of the, of the comic books where you could order a Frankenstein monster, you could order the x-ray specs and uh, the, the mini slot machine and just all sorts of other silly things. Um, here's where advertising is, is at somewhat of its silliest and most fun, uh, most fun aspects of it. 
So I would order these different things, and they would never be what what we wished they were. But it was always, it was always fun to look at. Now we are uh, flashed all the way forward to to contemporary times. This is Times Square. Uh, basically from a similar vantage point of the one that I showed you before where El when Elvis was born. Now we are no longer content with just a few uh, neon signs. We have, uh, you know, television screens stacked up, whatever that is, 20 stories tall and animated billboards and just the culture is exploding. And uh, sometimes people ask me, uh, you know, you're a pop artist, hasn't it all been done before? And hasn't everything been said about our popular culture? already and I completely disagree with folks when they say that to me because the culture has exploded and continues to grow at such a rapid pace that I feel that commenting on it is just irresistible. Um, here where we would have in the earlier picture of Times Square, maybe there were five TV channels, uh, five or ten national magazines, uh, no internet, <laughs> anything. And, and now in this age, we have 500 TV channels, 500 magazines, five billion websites. Uh, and to me, it, it's very interesting and very worthy of, of commenting about it in my art. Uh, this is the entry to, to my studio. Here I am working uh, on some type of um, drawing. And you can see some of the things that uh, I'm, I'm uh, enamored with or I'm inspired by. They're very simple uh, advertisements. Maybe this one is a crayon box. This back here is a grocery store poster that says beef tenderloin. Uh, there's a nice box here that has Hershey bar on it. And uh, here's the Skipper doll who was, I think, Barbie's little niece or cousin or something, I don't know. So anyway, uh, all of these silly kind of, here's a, car, here's a character from a, a cereal box. This is the type of uh, stuff that I just have a lot of fun with. And I find it to be r real fascinating to our culture. I also am interested in the very famous people of our time. So uh, in a similar way to where I showed earlier, artists were portraying uh, unimportant machine-made objects that we see over and over and over again. Uh, artists are also portraying famous people who we see over and over and over again. And they work their way into uh, that barrage of imagery that we see every day. Uh, this slide I just put on so that you could see how on the left is, is one of my finished paintings. And then these two graphics over here show the, uh, the printer's plates that were used to, to make this, to construct this painting. OK. This is uh, the confluence of the celebrity and the famous person. Here's Richard Nixon with Elvis. And we can even see, th this came out of the um, Presley family archives. And I just thought it was so, so cool that even presidents were admiring Elvis's cufflinks, <laughs> and you can just see on the 
Elvis's face, it's kind of like, yeah, this is what people do when they see me. They, they just kind of go into this state of awe. Okay, I'm going to go through a little explanation of the technique of silk screen next. So this is a piece of silk fabric, and it, it's what we call silk screen. It's about the consistency of a lady's stocking. Uh, it's a fabric, and it's made with real high-tech resolution in, in certain thread counts so that it can be used to, um, for printmaking purposes. That fabric is stretched onto a wooden frame, and if you were to look at this up close, there are microscopic little uh, holes in it, very much like the screen on your back door or a window screen. Then I work on making the design that is going to get, to get transferred onto the silk screen. Once the design is created, it goes in in a unit like this that, that has ultraviolet, uh, a bed of ultraviolet light bulbs in it, and the light bulbs uh, expose that image that I was showing there onto the screen, and it more or less burns the image into the screen. You can then wash out uh, you can wash out that screen and then your image area will be revealed. This is me with my studio team um, up in Chicago. You can see how freezing cold we are even when, uh, you know, even when we're indoors in Chicago. It, it's uh, not like Little Rock. It is, it is icy cold outside and so it's even cold in the shop. But this, you can see kind of like some paintings in progress and stuff like that. Here, uh, I'm washing out a screen and the, again, this purplish stuff is a photo emulsion and where you're able to see the transparency there, that's where the ink will be able to go through and eventually um, create this design using this as the printing plate. This is the finished work uh, of the Queen Elizabeth and uh, this, in this you can see multiple silk screens are being used one on top of another. So uh, there's a screen with polka dots on it. There's a screen with some wallpaper pattern, another one with another floral wallpaper, uh, this one with some, some like, uh, uh, I think it came from the circus or some type of uh, advertising design. And uh, you start to, to get an idea of what I do in my work or I, the story I try to tell with my work, which is that these images are just constantly bombarding us and they're almost many times random because we see this, we move from here to watching the TV, then we go out and drive and we see billboards and then we flip through magazines and we flip through the internet and we're just constantly bombarded with, with the images. And I wanted to capture that where all of those, to give a feeling like that was all happening within a single artwork. Um, I don't know if, I hope you guys remember this. This is quite a few years ago, but um, with the, uh, the Chicago cows on parade, this was my cow arriving at the studio. So sometimes I am asked to print and make silk screen prints on real difficult surfaces like a cow. Uh, <laughs> so, and that provides a, a whole new challenge in itself. Um, this is a, another similar project to the cows. This one was for global warming and uh, 
it was uh, started in Chicago, and the message was, uh, you know, what can we do to uh, help prevent global warming? And uh, so I'm showing you the, how the printmaking technique can actually be used on a curved surface. And then this is the finished sculpture installed in, uh, in Amsterdam. And you can see the, um, the mixture of um, hand painting and silkscreen printmaking on the sculpture. This is another up close picture of the silk screen. Uh, the UV light again is is very important to the hardening and the drying of the images. So this is me out in my back alley uh, setting out the screen so that they can kind of cure and the image gets burned into them extra strong by just letting them sit out in the sunlight for a while. Whoops, I went about well, three slides there. Okay, this, here's a shot of the inside of the studio. Um, it looks like a giant mess, I know, but there are, it, it is organized chaos. Uh, here are silk screens over here. This is a drying rack for uh, drying individual sheets of paper one at a time. And then, of course, work tables and everything else. Uh, this is shooting the other direction. You can see an Elvis painting is getting worked on right there. And more drying racks, more tables. And then Here's a demonstration of how I pull the ink through the silk screen, and it's done with a, uh, a tool called a squeegee that has a rubber blade on it. You put the paint down on here, you pull across, you pull across this surface with that squeegee, and that pushes the ink through. And when you see the, uh, the paintings in the exhibition, you'll, you'll be able to see what I'm talking about there because that's what creates the design onto the painting. The, the various silk screens then add up to levels of, of um, various designs. Again, hearkening back to the inspiration of the ghost signs and the, the continual uh, images incoming. And I mix it in with uh, hand painting and, and printmaking. Here's a finished painting that uh, has some Americana with the you know, we love the open road and, and driving our cars and Route 66 and that type of thing. And so here you can see kind of all around how the various layers that I'm building up all tend to find their own place within the picture frame. This is a photo of a grocery store poster that has been uh, graffitied on a little bit. But again, this is the type of thing that I see if I'm just walking around town. I'll see something like that and it, it inspires me even though it looks boring and unimportant or something like that. But I get, I really get inspired by just the shapes and the colors. So, this is a painting where I used s some grocery store posters. Uh, the design is, uh, the um, design of the grocery store poster is actually upside down. You can word, read the words like Betty Crocker across here and it says cake mix upside down two for a two for five dollars I think. So it's it's a case where a um, comic book hero in this case Cisco Kid is just being uh, portrayed as another image that impinges on us. 
This is uh, Cisco Kid's girlfriend, and she also totes a gun. And again, you can see the uh, cake mix poster in the background. So roughly kind of think Campbell's soup can and what has evolved uh, into the art that's being made nowadays. Okay, we're finally getting to the uh, to Elvis. Elvis, uh, I've learned through through going through these archives, was uh, really just an amazing guy. Uh, he he had a lot of fun with his fans. He he always gave extra time to his fans. He let them line up out in his carport. He would go out and sign autographs in this face in this case he's autographing the girl's forehead and uh, there are many pictures of him just cutting up and being a character and uh, from everyone I've talked to who knew him he he really was just a uh, a genuine artist and and a really uh, just a, a fun guy to be around so when I uh, went to begin making the Elvis artworks, I started looking for the backgrounds that I could use, similar to where I showed you the, the cake mix background. Well, I wanted to use some images from Elvis Presley that, that told his story. And I looked for... Uh, I looked for uh, ticket stubs, old invitations. In this case, this was a, a poster to, uh, to go to a dance, I guess, that Elvis Presley was playing at. If you can imagine uh, back in the day that you could actually go see Elvis play at a little club and, and go to a dance where he, he was playing and he just had a very few hits at that time and he was not yet even popular enough to get his name spelled correctly. <laughs> so, and so I'll take an item like that and bring it into a contemporary painting where I'm showing Elvis dancing and the, uh, the old poster provides a, an interesting uh, background. For the, for the artwork. Here's the uh, source material for another painting that I did, and here's the final product of the painting. And uh, this painting, actually I think all these paintings are, are in the exhibit. Uh, so here he is, uh, you know, live, live from Las Vegas with his uh, in the uh, in the jumpsuit era, and incidentally, uh, the to to there, it's kind of hard to understand how huge of a star Elvis was, um, or how big of an influence on popular culture that he was. But shortly before this, uh, shortly before this era of his performing, he did the um, Aloha from Hawaii. Uh, it was like a, a, a satellite broadcast or something, which nowadays we would think of as like a, a podcast maybe, or a, something that was available uh, all over the world, live, at one moment in time. So the point I'm trying to make is that that Elvis, live from Hawaii, had more viewers than viewed the moon landing. So you have, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around that. So uh, these type of personages take on a, a larger-than-life uh, place in our culture, and they just become really etched in our, in our memories. 
Here's another just beautiful source shot of Elvis that came from uh, the Presley archives. And then here's my, uh, my interpretation of it. Um, and he just, I don't know, there's just something magnetic about Elvis. He, he really, he was so photogenic and uh, I'm making just new paintings of him to try to, to uh, recapture the, the, the liveliness of, of his spirit. This is another source photo from the archives, and then this is the painting that I made from that. So um, with that, I'm going to end my talk, and I guess I can take questions. Very good, yes. Yeah? Any questions for Peter, and we'll get a microphone to you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, One second. The, the pop art things like the Warhol, uh, Campbell soup things, is there, any, every, is there ever any problems with trademark infringements? Well, it's, I, I, I believe that um, Campbell soup did sue Andy Warhol for many years. I'm not exactly, you know, don't quote me on that, but um, there are provisions within our laws that, that do protect the artists because we want, you know, we want to preserve the freedoms and we want to uh, allow a, a room where commentary and criticism can be made. So, um, and with my art as well, I'm making a commentary on our popular culture and I don't use more than, than what I need and I create transformative new meanings with the images. And, and you can kind of see that with the Warhol where he's, he's creating a whole new, all of a sudden he's getting us to really think about something that we just walked by every day without a second thought. Um, so the law does permit artists to make fair use of such images um, so that they can make commentaries and criticisms within their work. Yes, sir. One second. Illustration, oh, pardon me, in one of the illustrations, you had a uh, milk commercial from the grocery store uh -huh. and it had a lot of scribbling on the front. Yeah. I think that, was that a gang sign? I, I don't know for sure. It easily could have been, but it's just uh, where I live is an extremely urban, I live in downtown Chicago, so there's almost nothing that doesn't have some sort of scribbling on it. <laughs> but uh, even that, it, I don't know, it shows the passage of time that maybe that, that sign has been out there a while and things have happened to it. And those are things that I just find interesting um, about uh, our ever-changing environment of our, of our popular culture. So, Over here. Yeah. Um, yes, I was wondering, um, you mentioned and you sh showed several different photos of uh, visual bombardment, if you will, uh -huh. of images that influence you. I wondered if you, in working with the uh, Elvis uh, group, if, if you are influenced by any auditory uh, interviews or things of that nature that um, aren't per se visual. I have. Um, I spent uh, a lot of time researching right when I first uh, started working with them. I spent a lot of time learning about Elvis and actually one of the beauty, beauties of the web is that there's some amazing archive stuff out there now that we wouldn't have been able to see or hear otherwise. So you can actually go and listen to some of the interviews that Elvis gave back in the day. 
um, and you can see you know his first appearance on the Ed Sullivan show you can see all of that material that without the internet we probably would have to go to like a museum of broadcast history and look it up and make a special reservation and get to look at it one time so um, yeah, I did listen to a lot of Elvis music, and I, I've been a huge Elvis fan ever since I was a kid, so uh, I, I had an innate sense of, of the music itself, but it was also interesting to uh, see these other, uh, these other things, especially the, the recordings where he was talking in interviews. I found those to be really fascinating, so. Anyone else? Peter, for those um, who are interested, can you tell us where, if people are interested in purchasing some of your work, do you have galleries that is available? Do you have a website? I know all of the pieces you have in the collection, a lot of those are also for sale, but just wanted people to know how they can uh, contact you or if you're, they're interested in some of your work. Sure. Um, I do have a website, of course. Um, and if you just Google my name, it'll probably pop up as the, the first site. And then you can also, from there, you can kind of see all the other galleries I'm showing in. Um, one of the more interesting uh, experiences I've had in over the course of this past year has been uh, showing this uh, Elvis material in Australia and New Zealand. And they have a very shared culture to us, and you know how we kind of admire everything Australian and we love their accent and everything? Well, they kind of have that same um, interest in our culture, and uh, so they are very interested in Elvis, and there are tons of Elvis fans down there. So I did a couple of big shows, one in um, Sydney and in Perth, and uh, Oh, geez, I can't remember the name of the other city. But uh, I do show in other galleries around the country, and um, particularly in Soho is, is kind of the art, art mecca of the United States. Uh, and, uh, and then in some other really beautiful galleries. So if you do get a chance and you're traveling somewhere, you never know, just look it up and maybe you'll uh, Maybe you'll find an, a nice gallery to, to start to explore, and you'll be like, I know that guy, you know, so. Well, Peter, thank you so much for coming back to Little Rock again. Uh, thank the Clinton Foundation, Stephanie Street, Joyce Cuban for partnering with the school. Um, our, our new class of students is doing their orientation right now. We have the largest class here at the Clinton School of our history, and the flags that are on this wall represent the, uh, the countries that they're all from. So uh, we, we hope to see you all at some of our future programs, and uh, have a great day. Thank you.